Okay, so let's get started with the fun stuff. So we had several assignments that you guys were working on. Um, first was downloading Thani and watching the getting started video on that. Again, not I'm not trying to be religious in my support of that particular Python IDE. Everybody remember what IDE stands for? Integrated Development Environment. So we could go to a console, you know, window, a command prompt window and do it all manually, but that's no fun. The integrated development environments do it for us, um, compiling our program, running our program, showing us the output, collecting our input, all that stuff. It's just a little bit more fun environment for an educational type experience. It just makes it a little bit easier to, to get what we're trying to point out. I'm not trying to make people experts at Python or experts at running things from the command line and managing files and stuff like that. You can get that anywhere. But um, you know, just trying to learn how to program and the concepts of programming is what we're trying to get in this class. So the IDEs make it a little bit easier and we're using Thani because it's free slash cheap, easy to install and doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, and it has a decent user interface for the kind of features we're gonna be using in here. Same with Flowgorithm, um, not trying to be religious about that. There's other programs out there, Visio, Raptor, or some other options that you might even see reference by mistake. This course used to use Raptor. And so if you see in the homework references to Raptor or something like that, just know that that's old content and let me know if you see it and I'll get that corrected because it's probably a mistake. And then for the pseudocode, we typically just use some simple program like Notepad or some other text editor, whatever your favorite one is, because um, we're not trying to overthink it when we're doing the pseudocode part. It's meant to be a, an initial planning tool to get our design in our head, to get organized before we start programming, not to try to make things over complicated. So like if you're going into Thawney and you're writing your program and testing it, debugging it and everything, and then you go to turn it in and you realize, oh shoot, I forgot to do the pseudocode. You're kind of doing it wrong because the pseudocode is supposed to be the simple, easy, quick, getting started part of it. If you've already written the code, there's no real point to the pseudocode. So um, I have, I've had several questions about, you know, how do I get started using Flowgorithm or how do I get started using Thani? Make sure that you see that in the, in the modules in uh, Canvas that there are a couple of links to videos on how to do that. Or you can just Google. There's many, many videos out there on both Thani and Flowgorithm. You know, pick your favorite, the one that helps that make sense to you. That's fine. Um, okay. So I figured I would just go through one of the ones that was in there in Canvas for you to work on. So the first one was calculate the miles per gallon for the trip. So the pseudocode on that, just kind of getting started, kind of thinking it through a little bit. We'll just say begin. And then the first thing that we're going to do, it says get the number of miles traveled and the gallons of gas used and display the miles per gallon. Okay. So when we're thinking about getting started, the best thing to do is start by identifying the inputs, the outputs specified and asked for, and any calculation steps that you can think of. So for this one, the inputs are going to be get number of miles traveled. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Next is get the gallons of gas used. And for this particular program, that's really all of our inputs, right? So next is our processing steps. The processing step here is basically to calculate the miles per gallon. And then the outputs, the only output that's listed in this program is the miles per gallon. And that's it. So we would just say N. So quick, easy, not overthinking it. We're just kind of extracting what's in the problem, putting it on paper, and we kind of know what we're going to do now. So if you turned this in and that was your pseudocode, I'd probably say, excellent. Maybe later when the problems get a little bit more complicated, 
There might be other details that I would prefer that you pull out and notice while you're reading the, the requirements. But now we could probably put away the, the assignment and just focus on our pseudocode to go to the next step. Okay, so let's say we're gonna do the flow chart next. Um, I can do either one next, it doesn't matter. But again, the flow chart is a, supposed to be, it's intended to be a design tool. So you would think that we would do the flow chart next. Um, again, if you are doing the Python code and running it, testing it, debugging it, adding to it, iterating over and over, adding more details, et cetera, until, okay, now my Python program is ready to turn in. And then you notice, oh, it asked for a flow chart too. You're kind of doing it backwards, <laughs> right? Because you already know what the flow of the program is. So creating a flow chart from it, like creating the pseudocode after the fact, is sort of like out of order, right? So we'll do the flow chart next. So the first thing is getting the number of miles traveled. And I'm kind of like you guys do, I'm kind of doing some of these things intentionally wrong so that you see that it's not fatal and you can correct things afterwards. So the first thing I do is I add an input statement here and I say, let's say um, miles traveled is the thing that I want to get. Uh, what did I do wrong? It doesn't let you use underscore. No underscore, okay. Another naming convention that I like is this one where you just capitalize each letter of the word. Did the book talk about what style of naming <laughs> this is? There's, there's lots of names for the different styles of naming conventions that people use. Uh, this one I typically hear called camel casing because it starts out lowercase and then each word that you put in the name of the variable has a hump, right? You capitalize the first letter of each word. So this is another naming convention that's very common and I like, miles traveled. So it says input miles traveled. Now, if you've done this already, you probably already know that that's gonna be a problem. I'll go ahead and run it here just to see. Ah, variable not declared. Anybody else get that error? Yeah. <laughs> so, oh shoot, I forgot to declare my variable. No problem. I'll just go here, declare miles travel. Is it an integer or a string? I guess this is a number, so we're gonna call it an integer. That sounds fine. Okay, now I've declared my variable. I've input it. Notice I'm have to fill in a little bit more level of detail here than I did in my pseudocode. It was okay to be casual and a little free and loose with the pseudocode. It's, it, this is meant for communicating between humans or you know, if we're doing it all by ourselves, then it's meant to help us get organized, like a rough draft of a research paper, that kind of thing. It's not supposed to be precise and 100% correct. We might even have logic problems in our pseudocode from time to time that we don't notice until we actually get to the coding. Okay, so the flow chart, we've got our one variable and get the gallons of gas used. We probably need to do another one, right? So let's declare another variable. Gallons use. That sound okay? I'll add an input. Use the same variable name. Okay, so now I've got my inputs taken care of. So I can go on to my processing statement. Okay. Which one of these boxes am I going to use for the calculation step? Yeah. Um, does it matter if you declare all your things and then put the input, or do you have to do it like one? It does not matter. Yep. Yeah. Good question. In fact, a lot of people would tell you that proper programming style is to think ahead to all the variables you think you're going to need and declare them up front. So it's a very good question. So what what kind of shape am I going to use for this next one for the calculate the miles per gallon? 
Assigned. Assigned, yep. Yeah, there wasn't one that said calculate or processing or whatever. It was just called assigned by flow driven. So just kind of had to suss that out a little bit. Okay, variable. Uh, miles per gallon and the expression. Let's see, what is it? Uh, one. What? One. Well, we're calculating it. Miles traveled. Miles traveled. Okay. Divided by. Right. So I'm just giving it the variable names that I declared before. And I'm using this in this little math expression to calculate the miles per gallon. Make sense? And if, as long as I didn't have a typo in my variable names or screwed up something else, then I should be okay there. Um, I'll probably have to declare miles per gallon. So I think you guys are getting the point of that. So I'll just go ahead and declare it. Miles per gallon. I'll go ahead and just make that integer I can. And then that's our processing step. So now we've got the output. So I'll use an output statement. I'm going to output miles per gallon. Okay. So it wasn't uh, terribly complicated for this particular assignment. Again, they might get much longer, much more complicated in future assignments, but this one we were just trying to get some practice and not overthinking it. So it was pretty simple, straightforward. So I, if I want to, I can go ahead and start the Python program, or since Flowgorithm is kind of cool like this, I can test it right here in, in Flowgorithm. I'll just show you that once. Uh, variable not declared, miles per, see, mile per gallon. I forgot the S, so that was a typo. So it let me know that. So I can come in here and correct it. Miles per gallon. So I'll run it again. Excellent. So apparently all my variables are now declared. And it says down here at the bottom, please enter a value of type integer for miles traveled. Now let's see, 400 miles. Enter. Now it says, please enter a value of type integer for gallon used. Say 25. And it outputs 16. And we didn't put a whole bunch of fancy prompt tech, you know, text in there, please enter the blah blah blah, or the miles per gallon is, you know, this is just kind of quick and dirty to make it work. So you can see on the right side, these are the numbers that I input. And on the left side, there's the number that I output. Notice it doesn't really say anything for the processing step. Those are invisible. It just kind of does them quietly behind the scenes. The only thing that you're going to see here in Flowgorithm is what you input and what it output. Okay. Done and done. So if that was our assignment. We could come in here and save this, you know, file, save as give it a name, put it where we want it to be stored, and upload it and turn that F, what is it, FPRG or F, I don't know, it starts with a F, but whatever that file extension is, here, yeah, FPRG. Then you put that on your desktop, you put it in documents, wherever you want to put it, and then that would be the file that you upload to turn in the flowchart. Make sense? Any questions about the flowchart? Okay, so now that we've got that, we can come over here to Thonny. If you're able to download Thonny, um, you know, this is what it looks like. Thonny's a little bit more lenient, I guess, on the whole variable declaration thing. The people that developed the flow charting tool, Flowgorithm, they didn't want to let you off the hook there on declaring your variables. But like if I say X equals five, and then run it, it's just going to say, okay, yeah, no problem. So it doesn't enforce the whole, you have to declare your variable ahead of time. Thing. Still a good idea, but, you know, um, 
You just don't have to in body. Okay, so let me refer back to my flow chart since it's my handy um, design tool here. So input miles traveled. So I can say uh, miles travel equals, and if you remember from last time, what we have to do with this, the syntax of the Python language means, you know, I could say input, please enter miles travel in your car. You know, you can make this message as descriptive as you want it to be, right? It's your program. Um, you know, I've seen people say, you know, be, being cute like this, you know, please enter the miles traveled in your car, stupid. But, you know, okay, that's funny, you know, when you're first getting started to be kind of cute like that. But, you know, if you're trying to develop a, a professional software application, you know, we try not to do some stuff like that, obviously. It's like when people get started developing web pages. And initially, they make it bright red headings and, you know, fuchsia, you know, words on the page. And then this part's blinking because they're learning how to do all that stuff on the web page. And then after a while, people are like, okay, you're giving me a migraine with that. Cool it. Just make all the text black with a nice, cool blue background, right? Make it look nice and professional. So it's the same thing here. Um, you know, have fun with it, whatever. But if we're going to turn it in for an assignment or if a boss is paying for us, we're probably just, just going to keep it professional. Um, and then we know that we want this thing to be numeric. So we're going to have to convert it to an integer. Right? Yeah. Okay. So that's the miles traveled statement. Then we got to get the gallons used. Now, please give me amount of gas used. And remember, I'm putting the little colon and space afterwards just because it will look prettier when it's displayed and I'm running the program later. Okay, that's my inputs and I can put a nice little comment up here. You know, at some point, you'll probably get graded on your judicious use of comments. I don't need a paragraph of comments per line of code. You know, the way I look at this is like if my little brother was sitting next to me and I was trying to say, okay, hey, this is what this is about to do. I'm just trying to explain it to another person that you know is about the same skill level as me but just telling them, hey, this is what I'm about to do. That's the way I write comments. So now I'm gonna say, do the calculation step. Here, our calculation step is to calculate the miles per gallon. So miles per gallon equals, what was it? Miles traveled divided by gallons used. And display the outputs. Print the miles per gallon for this trip was. Remember, we talked about the plus that for numbers, that means add them together. For strings, that means put them next to each other. Remember last time when we had the example and we had the two two digit numbers and they, they put them side by side instead of adding them together. So we have to keep that in mind. And we have to convert the miles per gallon back to a string. So we put str miles per gallon. Does that all look kind of familiar and everybody comfortable with that? Okay, so let's see if we can run it. Please enter miles traveled in your car. 450. 
Now, please give me the amount of gas used, 22 gallons. The miles per gallon for this trip was, now that's interesting, isn't it? That it gave me this big, huge decimal number when logarithm didn't do that. Remember, logarithm gave me an integer. Did anybody catch how we came across that difference between the two programs? That's true. That's true. I did use different inputs, so it's okay to get a different output. But I was specifically talking about why did I get all these little decimal things out here? Because the other one I think should have been a decimal number too. I didn't use like a round number, if I remember right. Well, the main difference is in the uh, fact that here I had to declare my variables. On the variable over here, I declared it as an integer. Over here, I didn't declare it. So Python assumed what I, or inferred what I wanted the declaration to be. And I mean, this is a small detail, but it's just something to be aware of because it will catch you. The output of a division statement is a real number, you meaning decimal, right? It's a real data type. If I had said real over here instead of integer, I would have seen a similar output. I would have seen all the little decimal values after the period. Okay. So it's, I was a little sloppy with my data types, is what I'm trying to point out. If I was paying a little bit more attention, maybe I'd have made that real. If I was declaring my variables over here in Bonnie, maybe I wouldn't have noticed it because I would have done the same thing. And that's what declaring your variables at the top gets you. If I had come up here and said, int miles traveled, gallons used per gallon. If I had done that, then I would not have seen all those decimal things. Let's see if that's true if I'm lying to you. That. Okay, what did I do wrong? Huh? You got the brackets. Brackets? Right. Help me out here. Parentheses. Parentheses? Oh, uh, there's something going on here with my syntax. Let's see oh, if I should supposed to do it individually. No, I'm supposed that's to use period. a semicolon. Any that's, that's in C. Equal it to zero. Really? Is that what it wants? Okay, I'm mm -hmm. I'm being stupid here. What what what's the issue? Am I going to have to go to Google? Surely you guys are smarter than Google. Okay, so uh, the answer is there is no uh, Declaring variables in Python. I think um, here we uh, change the answer to an integer and so it can get it. Yeah, so Python declares the variable and establishes the data type when you assign something to it. So I could say this will be a little bit fancy equals. Zero comma zero comma zero. So that sort of kind of declares them and sets them to a value all at the same time. And this is doing something called a tuple, T-U-P-L-E. So this is a three 
tuple. I don't know why they call them tuples when there's three of them, but you get the point, right? It's a it's a set of values. Um, in math, we might call that a vector. Okay, it's a set of values, and so I'm going to assign the set of values zero 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 to the set of variables listed there. Let's see if that works. Oh yeah. So what did I say? Four twenty five. 22. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so when I when I say this is equal to the result of this division, it stomps all over the fact that I set it to zero with a new value and a new data type. So the declaration doesn't help at all. I basically have to do this if I want to cause the same behavior over, as over in the Python thing. Sorry about that. 450. 22, there. Now I get it rounded to the, to the uh, integer. Anyway, I'm just kind of playing around here, showing you different stuff, messing around. Um, but that's a, a demonstration of what you should have done with that first assignment. And then with the other three or the other two, it's basically just wash, rinse, and repeat, do the same thing for those. Okay. I know some people have already turned it in. Um, other people were like, what the heck is this? I have no idea how you can get started. Both ends of the spectrum are perfectly fine at this point. Yeah. Did we have to use one of them or can we just draw out the, the flow chart? If you pulled up a napkin at your local watering hole and you drew the little symbols on there and took a picture of it, turned that in, I guarantee I will take that. <laughs> flow rhythm just happens to be a nice tool that has features and Sorry, that's definitely what I did. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so on this assignment, I definitely used like the integer inputs, but later on, I ended up using float. Yeah, float. Because like, yeah, like I didn't, I didn't, wasn't thinking about it until later on. Like, what if it's like twenty point five miles that they went yeah. or something like that? Okay. Yeah, and then later on, you'll get into how to format your print statements. You know, there's ways you can do this this print so that uh, instead of STR, you can actually format it to have the dollar sign and the number of decimals you want, all that cool stuff. Again, Python's a cool language that has all kinds of things. It's stuff easy, like honestly. It. Like for beginners, it's very easy yeah, yeah, to understand. Yeah, yeah Jim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, me. Uh, so, you're not, so are you not uh, on takeaway points that we submitted late? No, get it turned in. This, this is practice. Uh, yeah, get it done. Get it turned um, in. Can I ask? No, no. Just probably for a future reference, I'll definitely put them in more. But you may be worried. I didn't really use as much wording as you did. I just kind of it's there's words in there, but it's mostly just numbers at the end. Does yeah. That matter? Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. Right. The, the the intention, especially with these first three, was just get you practice using the tools and just do it. Get it turned in correctly and, and get the practice. Yeah. You want me to do my assignments are gonna come in or just like what? Like when a new assignment, you're going to be up uh, Whenever I get them out there. <laughs> I know that's kind of a circular segment, oh, but I'm still working on it. There's been right. a lot of curveballs this semester already, and I'm playing catch up. So I'll get them. This was for this week, right? This was for this week. All right. Um, I had a question about the code I did. Oh, I the uh, spending one, mm -hmm. I believe. So I already finished it, but I wanted to add like more to it. Is that okay? Like if we do yeah, something like absolutely. that, like, just go ahead and upload it. So what I wanted to do was like, as you said, um, except the user's monthly pay amount. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do like in the beginning to add like what month is um, it, what month of the year is it, and then I wanted to put like a code where um, you can add the uh, the month with the other codes. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So when it asks you like how many, how much did you make this month? It would be like the month that you input um, yep. the on the first line. I was struggling with that though, so I don't, I don't know how to get that. So yeah, I, it, I mean, this is the kind of thing, the reason why I don't just say um, set X to five, set Z to two, yeah. blah, 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 is because showing you some examples of some real world programs that you could write and, you know, kind of spur your creativity, I'm hoping. No, the no other yeah. kind of things. That's that what I was trying to do, you know. Yeah. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Um, I know like with later on the assignments, like it says like do like set it to do 
so and so and then okay now change your code to do that are you just looking for the final code yeah okay because I'm, I'm trying to illustrate the fact that most of the time you're going to be iterative and there's a uh, software development philosophy called lean or agile and that's what they actually recommend even if you're starting a huge conglomerate company and you have to write software for it the first thing is get it up and running it does nothing but at least it's running the next thing is add the most important feature that you want your customers to see. Then continue adding and adding and adding and adding value over time and get to where you're very good and very efficient at delivering the product, regardless of what that product is. And then the bells and whistles will come later. Too many companies in the past have, um, even people that think they're the smartest people in the room, have tried to bite off a whole bunch and they have a six or 12 month development cycle to develop this big, huge project and they never ship it because they run out of money and it's still only half done. There's this, you know, a bunch of jokes about this. If you read Gilbert comics, you see similar things, but there's a bunch of jokes along the lines of every software development project is half done at any point in time during its software project, right? Because and you just keep adding bells and whistles and bells and whistles and you never ship anything until you run out of money and then you have to close the doors. So Agile says, keep delivering value iteratively. And so when I when you see things like that in the project, it's, yeah, get it to this stage and then add something else and then add something else. Often it's a lot harder when you get hired at a software company to sit down with an existing pro program and find one little bug or to add one small, simple feature to it. So that is a skill too, is understanding what's there and how to fit some small change into it without breaking everything. So that's what the deal is there. Okay, so that was the first thing I wanted to do. The next thing I wanted to talk about is, um, we're gonna start doing conditional statements next. Conditional statements are Basically, if then else. So, um, if uh, x is greater than five, print x. You know, that's a simple conditional statement. And that's just the very beginning. They're going to get much more complicated, as you'll see in the book. There's so many variations. I mean, this is the thing that you have to master is the the conditional statements, conditional logic and implementing that in your programs. But what I wanted to talk about is I wanted to pose a logical conditional statement for you that will hopefully tie this to things, again, in the real world that you come across all the time. You deal with conditional statements all day, every day, and you may not even realize to the extent to which you deal with conditional statements already. So let's just say that I have this conditional statement that says, if I pass my high school finals, then I will apply for college. Everybody understands what that means. We're all humans. We digest that. We think, oh yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. If I pass my finals, I'll apply for college. So I, there are terminology that we want to understand. For example, um, these terms are things like the converse of that, not the shoes, but the logical word converse. Um, there's the inverse of that. There's the, uh, another big word, contrapositive of that. And we can, you know, if we look up the definition of those words, we can take our initial conditional statement and we can come up with the converse of that, the inverse of that, and the contrapositive of that, right? Um, if you take a philosophy class or any kind of logic-based class, you'll probably get into those things and they will beat those to death. But understanding these to a certain extent will help you to recognize and take things in the real world or assignments that you're given and convert those into the Python code that you need to you know, implement a program. So if we're talking about the converse of that statement, let me ask you a question. Given this statement up here, 
Is it true that if I applied for college that I passed my high school finals? Yes. Okay, well that would be an example of asking the converse of that statement, right? So I could have applied for college even if I didn't pass my finals, right? right. I could. I could also um, pass my high school finals and not apply to college. Is that true? True. And this one pretty much says, if I pass my high school finals, I will apply for college. So if that's true, then saying that I passed my high school finals and I didn't apply for college, that, that wouldn't hold, right? And that's a kind of logic uh, discussions you have to kind of get into here. But the converse is, you know, taking the second half of that and saying, well, if that's true, if I applied for college, does it mean that I passed my high school finals? Nothing says that. It might be true, but I could have applied for college despite whether I, I passed my finals. That's all I'm saying here. Okay, the inverse. Is it true that if I did not pass my high school finals, that I did not apply for college. Yeah, same kind of twist there, right? But you get what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm taking certain parts of that, I'm making them true, I'm making them false, and seeing if those all hold true. And what I want to point out there is, and then the contrapositive, I'll go ahead and finish the point here. Is it true that if I did not apply for college, that I did not pass my high school finals. That would be an example of a contrapositive. So the point here isn't to get all tied up with the finals and applying for college and all that. It's just to understand the positives and negatives and reversing these conditions and thinking about the logic and things like that can trip you up. So the, the main reason I wanna point that out is that there's this thing called a truth table, okay? A truth table is something like, if I have a condition A and a condition B, you know, like A is I passed my high school finals. B is I applied for college. And I can say, true and false up at the top. And I can say, if A is true, does that imply B? And if B is, if A is false, does that imply if B is false? And I can come up with all the different combinations of stuff there. This is a bad example, so I'm not gonna go through that with this one. But, um, um, so, Another word for this is decision tables. It means the same thing, truth tables, decision tables. It's just mapping out all these things. So the, what I'm gonna actually do here is I'm gonna use the operators and or, and a new one you may not have heard of, which is exclusive or. Has anybody heard of exclusive or? Okay, a couple of you. Good deal. Oh, sorry. Okay, so if I'm gonna talk about and, so if I've got A and B, A could be true. Well, let's say, uh, so let's say A is true and B is true, then A and B is what? If A is true and B is false, then A and B is false. You see where I'm going with this. So I've exhausted those. So now I have to switch to um, false for A, back to true, false, and false. And I can say, if A is false, B is true, 
A and B is false. A is false and B is false. A and B is false. So this would be a truth table for the and operator. And I could do the same thing for or. So if I've got a truth table here for or, A or B is, so true and true, true, true and false, true, false and true, or false or true, also true, false or false, false. And so you see pretty quickly the difference between these is here in the middle, um, with the and, both of them have to be true for the result to be true. And with or, either one of them can be true and the result will be true. And this is not terribly complicated, so sorry if I'm being a little bit pedantic about it, but uh, the exclusive or one that you maybe haven't seen, some people have seen, says if they're both true, then it's false. If they're both, uh, both false, then it's false. But if either one of them is true, then it's true. So only one or the other. That's why it's called exclusive or, because it has to be one or the other. It can't be both. So that's the truth table for exclusive or. So in Python, there are operators for all three of these. And then there's also not. A not B. Oh, actually, no, that, that's wrong. This is a lot easier. So not A would be false when it's when A is true. Not A would be true when A is false. And then we can get real crazy. We can do things like um, a and not B, and we can use parentheses. We can say B and not A or B and A. And, you know, I mean, we can get crazy with this stuff, right? And you'll see this kind of thing all the time in programming logic, very complicated conditional statements. And all I guess I'm pointing out to you is that when in doubt, list all your variables and come up with a truth table that says all combinations of those variables and what the output should be. And then you can try to glean. So there's a couple of different ways you can look at this. You can try to analyze and rationalize the different combinations and what the result is and see if that makes sense because maybe your logic is wrong. Another way to look at this is when you're testing your program, you want to test all of the different possible outputs and make sure that your inputs map to the correct outputs because maybe you have a logic problem. So Multi-purpose there. And this wasn't meant to be an exhaustive list. Like I said, you can get crazy. That's an infinite number of combinations of of logic conditions that you can use there. But this is how you break them down and create the truth table for them. Um, and hopefully that example or two will help you when you're doing your programs, when we get to conditional stuff in the next chapter. Okay, the next thing that I want to point out here, there's something called De Morgan's Laws. And it's just a little trick that you need to remember when you're doing programming logic with these if statements. It's uh, when you start combining these things. So I can say A and B, right? I can also say not A and B. And you just need to kind of remember that when you're trying to come up with your statements, this is equivalent to not 
a or not b. So when I split these up, I just have to flip the and to an or. And if you have any doubt, you can put these two things into one of these and, and do a, a truth table for it to prove to yourself that this last row is exactly the same, right? Similarly, not A or B is equivalent to not A or, or and not B. You just split them up and split the conditional statement of the operator, all right? Clear as mud there. If that's clear, then great. You've mastered the Morgan's laws. He probably uh, got famous creating stuff like that. And you just mastered it in a few minutes, right? <laughs> uh, similarly, there's another thing when you start talking about greater than and less than. So I can say, if A is greater than B, all right, there are two integers if five is greater than three. Yeah, that's true, right? Um, so we all understand A is greater than B. But when you use that not operator, not A is greater than B is, you know, this gets people a lot of times, is equivalent to A is less than or equal to B. Okay, so when you're going to reverse a less than greater than sign, you have to add the equal sign. Now, similarly, obviously, hopefully, um, if I set A is less than or equal to B, the not of that is A is greater than B. That makes sense. I, it seems really simple, but when you're sitting there trying to write a program, these little things can get you because you always have to consider that equals condition. You know, five is greater than three. My program's working great. You take the not off and you say five is less than three, still the same. It works just great. But then the next time you input A and you input B and they enter four and four, and you flip it around, and now my program doesn't work because I forgot to consider the equals part. So that's a gotcha to pay attention to. Okay. Now I'm going to pose hopefully a more interesting problem. So let me paste this little piece of code in here, right? This one looks a lot hairier, right? So I'm setting, just like I did before, I'm initializing these with a tuple, right? Everybody remembers that word, T-U-P-L-E. Tuple, as in multiple or, you know, I think that's where it comes from, or multiple is you know, using the same root word as tuple. Yeah. Um, doesn't um, tuple use a bracket and like tuple and list, list so they use a, a square bracket, tuple they use a square bracket. In math, yeah, in math the notation you, you would do the brackets and stuff like that, but it's not necessary here. Um, you know, as we had illustrated earlier, that works just fine. Um, so this is a valid expression in Python. But, okay, so let's walk through this a little bit. So I assign A, B, and C to zero, and then I get a value for A, enter one or two, and then I have several conditional statements here, you know, some equals, some greater than, and then over on the right, I'm setting some things. Um, Ooh, this one's cool. I'm using another tuple here. So if A is equal to two, 
then I'm setting B to two and C to C plus one. And if B is greater than zero. I add one to C. And then I got a print statement down here. Okay, so the thing I wanted to ask you about here, and this happens, you know, not this particular problem, but stuff like this happens when you're out working where your boss comes to you and says, hey, I got a bug report. Some user out in the field has reported that this code, this program is producing an error. And so we're supposed to go find out where that is. And so when we come across this line of code and it's like, wow, this does a whole bunch of interesting, weird looking stuff that I don't understand. And it could produce an error. But maybe there's some other program that you know somebody else wrote that is causing the error. Maybe it's not even this part. And you want to make sure that you're fixing the right thing, right? Don't fix it if it's not broken. Um, you might be looking at the wrong part of the code for the error. Um, you know, sometimes assumptions can bite you with stuff, stuff like this. So looking at this program, you might wonder, is this where the bug is? Or on the other hand, is this code even capable of producing an error? You know, based on this logic, would the word error ever get printed? We don't know, right? So you have to think about it to figure out if it's even possible. So what we would, one thing that we could do is we could come up with a truth table for this. So we can say, well, if A is equal to, let's say, I either enter one or two. If A is one, then what is B going to get set to? Two. So we have to walk through this, right? And this is a, another thing that I want to point out to you is how to desk check your code. Um, it's a little hard to illustrate on the computer, but it's really easy to illustrate on paper. Let me see if I can figure out a technology for that that will let me do this. Okay, so I've got this up here. Um, so if I was desk checking this, I would get a little piece of paper and I would write down my variable names, A, B, and C. And I'm gonna start out with nothing under them to start with. And then I'm just gonna start walking through my code. So the first line of code, says set those three to zero, zero, and zero, right? So I would write down a zero, a zero, and a zero. Next line of code, please enter one or two. So let's say we're gonna take the first case, it enters a one. So I scratch off the zero and I put a one. So at this point in the program, I can, I can absolutely state that the contents of my variables a is one, B is zero, C is zero. No question. So now I'm gonna execute the next line of code. If A is equal to one, set B equal to one. Was A equal to one? Yeah. Yes. So I'm gonna set B equal to one. So similarly, I scratch out the value of, of zero and I put a one. Same thing. Now at this point in my program, I can definitively say A contains one, B contains one, C contains zero. Remember, these variables are just buckets that hold a certain value in memory at a certain point in our program. But how come on B is one again? Because we just set it to one. Okay. As we're walking through in our head, um, we're the human compiler here. We ask the question, is A equal to one? Yes. Set B equal to one. That's the line of code we just executed. Then we move our finger down to the next line of code. If A is equal to two, now this is the funny one, right? Set B and C to this tuple. 
2 and c plus 1. A little bit complicated, but we're essentially doing the same thing. Is a equal to 2? No, it's not. So we're going to skip this line altogether, which is good. We don't have to figure out how to do that. And we're just going to go to the next line of code. All right, next line of code. If b is greater than 0, is b greater than 0? Yes. Yes. So we're going to set c equal to c plus 1. So this, in programmer language, says add 1 to c. If somebody says add one to a variable, that's how you do it. You set it to the current contents plus one. So C equals C plus one. So we're going to scratch out the zero. And we're going to add one to it. We're going to set it to what it was plus one. Now at this line in the program, we know definitively A is one, B is one, C is one. Next line of code. If C equals zero, print error. Does C equal zero? No. So we're not going to print error. We're going to skip that line of code and go on to the next problem. So now we can say user enters one, no error, right? Great. So let's run it again. Uh, come on, select. We'll start over with our desk checking. Back up here at the top. A equals zero, B equals zero, C equals zero. I brush back. Set the variables, go to the next line of code. This time we're gonna enter two. So A equals, and we get the input. So we're going to scratch that out and we're going to pretend that the user entered two. We're going to go to the next line of code. If A equals one, set B equal to one. Is A equal to one? Uh, no. So we're not going to set B equal to one. Next line of code. If A is equal to two, yes, it is. So we're going to set B equal to two. C to C plus one. Okay. Next line of code. B is greater than zero, is it? Yes. So we're going to set C equal to C plus one. Okay. Set it to two. And you see how I'm doing that. That's the whole point that I'm trying to illustrate here with the desk checking is you can definitively know what your program is doing by desk checking like this, right? The list of variables up here and setting them just like your program is supposed to be so you can understand what your logic is doing as you desk check. It. So now I'm down here to this one. If C equals zero, print error. Do we print error? No. So now I can say user enters two, no error. Excellent. So I've proven that it's not our code, right? I can go tell my boss, it's those other guys across the hall. I don't know what kind of beer they're drinking, but they need to cut that, right? No, because what happens if the user enters zero? What happens if the user enters nine or 99? We didn't test any of those, right? Oh, yeah, right. we only had either <laughs> one or two, right? We only did one or two. So that's the problem here with this code, right? Is if you enter anything other than what you expect to enter, the program does who knows what. Okay, let's do this again. I know it's a little pedantic, I'll go quickly. Yeah, the, uh, the point isn't how complicated or easy the problem is. It's getting the idea and seeing an example of how to desk check your program. So once again, A is zero, B is zero, C is zero. User enters zero. So A gets left zero. If A is one, it's not one. If A is two, it's not two. Is B greater than zero? Nope. Is C equal to zero? Yes. So I print error. 
So when the user enters zero, our program produces an error. Similar with 99, you might guess that, yeah, if it's 99, our program similarly produces an error. Okay? There's mud. I mean, this last case, you want to see me walk through the 99 case? Okay. Is it greater than? It could be. I, I like your intuition there. Okay, starting out the top again, zero, zero, zero. Enter a number, we enter 99. So it scratch that off, we change it to 99. Okay, if A is equal to one, nope. If A is equal to two, nope. If B is greater than zero, nope. If C is equal to zero, which it is, then we print an error. So when the user entered 99, once again, we print an error. Okay. So even though it says C equals C plus one, it's like all of, all of them supposed to be. Zero. Yeah, because we don't execute any of these. Oh, yeah. So since this was false, we didn't execute it. This was false, we didn't execute it. This was false, we didn't execute it. And then this was true, so it would print error. So now we can go back to our boss and say, okay, um, we figured out what the problem is. Somebody is not validating the user input. And so when we see a value we don't expect, our program produces an error. So this is a, just an example of conditional statements in a Python program and how to desk check it to see what the heck it's doing. There's a um, interesting web page that uh, talks about some of this stuff. If I can find it, here it is. you're interested in these deductive argument problems. I'm sure like anybody take like those standardized tests like the SAT test or ACT, if they still give that, yeah. you know, they have the logic section on there and they ask all these, uh, these questions like, if you bought bread, then you went to the store. You bought bread. Conclusion, you went to the store, right? And so they give you sort of a, a way that you can use these truth tables to figure out those problems and answer the questions about them. And this little arrow here is the word implied, is how you would read that. So if you bought bread implies that you went to the store, then you would write B arrow S. And then you have this truth table down here, bought bread, went to the store, then in this case, yes, buying bread does imply that you went to the store. And so then you can analyze the truth table um, and then answer questions about some other complicated statement. Like I said, I'm not going to go through all of this, but it, some of this stuff is pretty interesting and pretty fun to go through. And if you like brain teasers and stuff like that, then you, know, you have to study for the SAT and you can go out and learn this stuff. We don't need to know it to this extent for this class, but just know it's a much deeper hole that you can dig yourself into and go explore that uh, to your heart's content. Okay, so we're about a little over an hour into class. That's about as much as I wanted to say. Are there any questions about this?